Hello, everybody. Apologies for the wait. Uh, some of us were just coming from the medical radiation sciences session, but thank you so much for sticking with us and uh, still being here at 510. Um, and welcome to our second session at Virtual Program Week at the Mister Institute. So today we're going to be going through the imaging programs. Those are the ultrasound and magnetic resonance imaging programs. So uh, before we get started, I want to introduce our lovely panelists that we're having talk to us today. Um, so to start off, I'd like to introduce our chairs. So first off, we have Catherine Ladhani. Catherine, you want to do a quick introduction of yourself and your position at Michener? Would love to, but my video has decided to stop working. So hello, everybody. Um, Catherine Ladhani, I am the academic chair for uh, MRI uh, for this session, as well as radiation therapy and digital health and data analytics. Welcome. Apologies about that. I think the video should be working now, but uh, double check. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that, Catherine. Okay. Uh, and I don't know if Susan is online oh, quite yet. I am online. I'm just, oh, I think I'm labeled as Catherine Ladani, so I'm just trying to sort out my labeling. <laughs> uh, I will appear like Catherine until I can figure out which uh, exact thing to change it. But welcome, everyone. So uh, thank you so much for patiently waiting, and I'm the chair for the ultrasound program. Amazing. Thank you so much. And that is Susan, not Catherine. <laughs> and uh, next we have our amazing program communication liaisons. Um, first, I wanted to introduce Sheena. Sheena, if you wanted to do a quick intro to yourself and your position at Michener. Good evening, everybody. It's nice to have you here. My name is Sheena Bimji Hewitt. I'm the uh, ultrasound program uh, communication liaison as well as faculty in the program. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sheena. And next we have Shahida. Can you guys, oh, there it is, it's working. Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Shahida Suleiman. I'm one of the instructors in the MRI program as well as the program communication liaison. Thank you so much, Shahida. And finally, we have our incredible two students with us today. So first we have Michael. Hello, everyone. Yeah, so Michael is our representative from the ultrasound program. And then for MRI, we have Deanna. Deanna, if you wanna just quickly introduce yourself. having technical difficulties. That's okay. I see her there. She is there. <laughs> so Deanna is there. Um, okay. So with that, I wanted to move on. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for coming today and for our lovely panelists for joining us as well. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to go and going through the agenda. We have two programs on our agenda today, ultrasound and MRI. Um, so a few tiny amendments. Um, we are going to skip over the program overview video just in the interest of time, but we will be going through uh, the Michener Advantage briefly, which we like to say is our benefits to applying to Michener, going to Michener over other schools. Um, we are going to do our faculty panel with our amazing chairs and PCLs. Then we'll be doing a student panel. So we're asking our two wonderful students questions about their Michener experience. And I'll be going through the application process for our two imaging programs. And then we'll end with a live Q&A and some information on how you can contact us after the session is over. Okay. And with that, let's get into our land acknowledgement first. So the Michener Institute is situated in downtown Toronto. So we acknowledge the sacred land where we are today, which has been and continues to be the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River among many other unnamed and unrecognized Indigenous communities. At this location, we stand on land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. We recognize this agreement not as a thing of the past, but as a promise today and into the future. We must share the responsibility of ensuring that the dish is never empty by taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with and transforming our personal and institutional relationships. This meeting place is still home to many indigenous peoples across the whole island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on this land. We urge you as future Canadian healthcare practitioners and leaders to acknowledge that it is our collective responsibility to strengthen our ties in the communities we serve and practice healthcare in a way that advances the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's seven health-related recommendations and practice your profession in that spirit. Okay. 
And with that, I'm just going to briefly go over what we like to call the Mitchner Advantage. These are five features of the Mitchner Institute that make us unique in the healthcare space in the post-secondary post education space. So the first is our focus on healthcare. So we're actually the only post-secondary institution in Canada that has exclusively health professions as their programs. So we don't have any programs in business, no programs in art. We focus exclusively on applied health sciences. And because of this, some of our programs are very, very unique, one of the only kinds in Canada. We're also very career driven. So our programs are very hands on, very practical, very application based. And our graduates are actually over 95% employed six months after graduating. This is an average of 10% higher than other Ontario colleges. We're also part of the healthcare system. So in 2016, we merged with the University Health Network and our school is the only school in Canada that is funded by the Provincial Ministry of Health. Our curriculum is informed by cutting edge research and clinical innovations. So our students know exactly what it's like to work in a hospital, work in the healthcare industry, and in turn hospitals, healthcare industries, they know about our graduates. They know that they have very good training and that it will be great healthcare practitioners once they graduate. We also have incredible quality at the Michener Institute. We have small class size. I think our biggest class size at Michener is around 75 students, so much smaller than your typical college. We have very experienced faculty. They're all healthcare professionals. And almost all of our Michener full-time programs are accredited by Accreditation Canada. We also have heart at the center of all that we do. So we offer simulated patient scenarios. We want our students to know what it's like to have that great bedside manner with patients, care deeply about the patient at the most challenging time of their lives. And our graduates are among the most caring and skilled leaders in their fields of practice. And with that, I'm going to get into our first program today, and that is our ultrasound program. So with that, I'm going to be asking our incredible chair and PCL about the program about the profession. So our discussion with chairs and faculty. The first question I wanted to ask is, uh, can you describe the ideal candidate for this program? Sheena, why don't you start us off? You're, you're a sonographer and I think that's probably what our applicants are, are hoping to hear from and I can chime in at the end. Sure, I can do that. Um, the ideal candidate for the ultrasound program is, you know, a lot of commonalities between any kind of healthcare and ultrasound, right? You have to be patient centered. You want to be able to want to work with people and in teams. Uh, you need to be super motivated because it's not just technological advancement. It's also pathological advancement. You know, we're seeing new things every day because of the technology. So you need to be motivated to be a lifelong learner. Um, you need excellent communication skills and uh, language skills, as well as body language skills, eye contact, all of those soft skills. Um, but then there's the other part, you know, uh, besides the soft skills that you require in all the healthcare programs, you know, in ultrasound, if you imagine a piano player, uh, you, you know, they uh, ensure two of their hands. As a sonographer, you use your right arm all the time, all day long to scan, but you have to be a multi multitasker. So you need to be able to not only have a very strong body because you're using parts of it all the time, but you also need to have a mind that is able to critically assess what you're looking at and then decide what that pathology is. So in Canada, as sonographers, you don't tell the patient what they have, but you write a report of what you see. So by writing the report of what you see is crucial because if you as a sonographer don't see, the radiologist that does the reporting for the diagnosis cannot report on that pathology. Um, so yeah, that, that in a nutshell uh, is, uh, is you know, an ideal candidate. I mean, some people that are uh, very sporty, especially in racket sports, or if they're gamers, uh, we find they actually do really well in ultrasound because they have that multitasking ability uh, and also to be able to spatially kind of reason what they're looking at. Susan? 
The only thing I'll add to that, and it just actually was something I, I recognized again today, I got sent a, a Word a PDF document and uh, there was some font on it that I couldn't see like in a, in a bright yellow color and my eyes just don't pick it up. And that's something that's wrong with my eyes. But what I know about ultrasound is the students who do really well, they can see images in grayscale. Um, and, and the variations of grayscale. So if you're, you know, maybe a good visual learner or you've got that visual acuity of picking things up in gaming where you can see the bad guy popping around the corner, I probably can't see that. That's just what's wrong with my eyes. And, you know, I'd be a great sonographer in so many other ways. It's the visual acuity part for me. Um, that would be harder for me. And I'm just trying to make an example out of that um, from something that I just noticed today that uh, hadn't thought about in a really long time. But it's a, a, a great thing to think about if you enjoy that kind of quick thinking with your eyes and with your hands. It's a great career for you. And to add to, uh, to what Susan just said, you know, we're a we're we're very few uh, post grad programs in ultrasound. We're one of three right now, as far as I know. And so, with a post grad program, our program is shorter than you may find programs at other schools. So our program is two years long. So you need to be able to be really organized with your work. Uh, in order to, uh, you know, be able to manage the curriculum. And our prerequisite is anatomy and physiology. So you have to have a very, very solid grounding in anatomy and physiology before you start in order to do well in our program. Great, thank you so much to you both. I always love that gamer fact. I think that's really interesting because you don't really think about that. But uh, I've been telling people at Ferris that if you like, Video games, you should do my family stuff program. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, moving on to our second question here. Um, so what soft skills are required for a profession in ultrasound? I can start. Um, so, I, you know, soft skills is stuff that you acquire through life expertise, but they're also learned skills. You know, those are the skills that you can learn over time except for things like compassion and empathy. Those have to be something that is pretty natural to you. So if you like people, and if you have that natural empathy and compassion, um, you know that is what any healthcare program is going to look for, but communication is crucial. So your language skills, your tone, um, is really, really important in ultrasound because we know that when we miscommunicate and we, or we do not communicate well, that's when medical errors occur. So it's really important to be very concise, to write your technical impressions so that they're very concise and accurate, and to be able to also communicate verbally, not only with your patients, but your team. Susan, do you have anything to add? I think you've covered that, Sheena. I won't add anything additional to that. Thank Amazing, thank you so much. All right, our third question. Uh, so where can graduates of this program work? I'll get Susan can, to start. Yeah, I can start that one if you like. A number of our graduates will of course work in hospitals where there's uh, ultrasound um, clinics and maybe other areas such as vascular ultrasound or obstetrics clinics uh, that might employ sonographers, but also a number of our uh, graduates would be working in what are called independent uh, healthcare facilities or IHFs. And those are clinics located in various parts of our communities where all kinds of imaging scans are done and uh, they're doing the same types of tests that they would, in, would do in hospitals. It's a, just a smaller type of environment that's more focused on imaging healthcare rather than the whole um, hospital level of healthcare that that encompasses. Um, our graduates also work in education. They work with um, equipment companies. They work with uh, research. Um, I'm probably forgetting something there. Sheena, do you have anything to add that I'm forgetting about? Um, I think you've got covered most of it, Susan. So a couple of things also research is now uh, very progressive with including sonographers into their research programs. Uh, you can be a research assistant if, if you so feel. So our program uh, trains a specific kind of sonographer. So there are three fields in ultrasound. 
One is echocardiography. So you look and learn about the heart. There's vascular sonography. You learn about the extremity vascular structures, as well as some major vessels in the abdomen and thorax. And then you have the generalist. And the generalist sonographer in Canada is uh, basically encompasses you doing abdomen, pelvises, gynae, obstetrics, uh, deep vein thrombus studies. And so our program graduates generalist sonographers. There's a big, big demand all over Canada and in Ontario for these sonographers. And like Susan mentioned, mostly in hospitals and clinics, but you can also go into applications. Susan, I think you mentioned that, right? Applications and um, sales is another area. Um, more and more people are uh, specializing into things like um, looking at uh, MSK injuries in ultrasound or uh, specialty in sports, but it hasn't developed as much in Canada as it has in the US. So you have a wide variety of choices of where you can work. Amazing, thank you so much. Okay, so our fourth and final question for tonight is, can you describe a day in the life of a sonographer? I'll, I, I'll take that. So um, if you work as a generalist sonographer at a hospital or at a clinic, you have a requisition that is a request from a, usually a primary physician, but it can be from midwives, it can be from some nurse practitioners, and you would take that requisition, you would call out the patient, um, and before you actually go to call out the patient, a lot of times you will check that patient's clinical history. So what imaging have they done? Have they had anything done recently? You will then go and get the patient and you will get informed consent to do that examination. And you will do the ultrasound, not only according to the requisition, which is a primary source of what you're supposed to do, but we can actually critically assess and add an examination to what is already ordered sometimes. So uh, you need to have really, really strong skills in scanning, of course, and be competent in many areas. Once you've uh, scanned that patient, you will write a technical impression, which the radiologists will look at along with the images that you've taken in order to come up with a differential diagnosis. So that is basically not just a, a day in the life, but a little uh, point of contact for each patient. And in a day, you can do from about, um, depending on what you're doing, if you're doing obstetrics, you can do about eight obstetrics in a day. If you work in a department that does everything, so a mix of abdomen and pelvis and gynae and so on and so on, you can do up to 15 to sometimes even 18 cases a day. So it's a fairly busy day. But the nice thing is that uh, every patient you look at, just like we look different on the outside, I'm sure Michael, my student is giggling there, I say this so often, just like you look different on the outside, you look different on the inside a little bit too. So it's an interesting case for every single case that you do, you know, it's, uh, um, yeah. So similar skills, but you'll see different things. Amazing. Thank you so much. So thank you, Sheena and Susan, for those amazing insights. Um, and we're actually going to segue into our student panel now. So we're talking with Michael. So he's a current ultrasound student at the Michener Institute. Um, okay, so uh, Michael, the first question that we had for you today was, why did you choose the ultrasound program? Thank you for introducing me. And yes, yeah, Sheena, I was laughing because that is absolutely just our class that she was reiterating. So I chose the ultrasound program at Michener for a couple of reasons. I knew I was interested in ultrasound based on the type of, based on the day-to-day -day that she had described, the type of interactions with patients and the, uh, the work life. So I, that kind of got me interested in the field. And then I specifically chose Michener because a couple reasons. I have a, a couple of neighbors who had gone to Mitchell themselves and have careers in healthcare now, and they were explaining that they love their time at the school. They found it really um, good to get their career started, so word of mouth is a great start. Then being associated with 
UHN is a big draw for sure because that's a good reputation and that's just great. And a huge thing for me was the clinical placements. Like Emma said at the beginning, the school is very career focused and I knew 100% that I wanted to graduate from a program with experience working. So after three semesters of in-class stuff, we have a whole year of clinical placements. And um, that was a big deciding factor for me. And that's my reasons. Amazing. Thank you so much, Michael. Of course. Okay. So our second question for you is, uh, can you tell us about some of your ultrasound courses? This can be like a favorite course that you have, like something cool that you did in one of your courses. Yeah. So my favorite course is definitely the one that Sheena teaches. I'm not just being cute saying <laughs> that. Uh, Sheena teaches the ultrasound scanning course, uh, which is a four-hour class in person where myself and five other students just takes turn, take turns scanning each other with the ultrasound machines. And I'm two months in, so I'm mostly used to it, but it's still super exciting to use, super exciting to apply anatomical knowledge on each other with the machines uh, and, you know, get, get used to what professionals do. So that's fun. And Emma, to go back to one of your things as well, uh, you said that we use actors. That's also a lot of fun. One of our classes, we work with, um, you know, fake patients where we get to kind of practice different interactions. And that's a lot of fun as well. So really the fun ones are the ones that are a bit less theoretical, a bit more applicable. And I'm that, those are definitely my favorites. Amazing, thank you so much. I think it was um, one of our other chairs who said a presentation like with a dummy, if you mess something up, it's okay. You can just turn the dummy off, turn it back on. Whereas with the person you cannot. So that's a good part of simulations. Um, okay, so our final question for today is, ah, can't find the mouse, okay. So what's it like for you, Michael, being a student at Michener? So academically, it's decently busy. We have class, it's only four days a week. So we have a three day weekend, but the classes in my program run around eight hours. So they, they take up most of the day, but they're busy, but the, the classes do complement each other in a lot of ways. So it's easy to, to, to make content engage with other content. So it's not, I don't want it to seem daunting. Uh, the classes are pretty small. My program only has 24 students. So you really get to know each other, you get to know the professors. And, um, and, and I love that because at, at U of T you're anonymous. So here it's, it's great to, get to be sociable. On a less academic note, I'm not super involved in stuff that happens at the school. I don't live on campus. I'm not in the student council, but I can say that whenever I am in the building, there's always something going on. There's always a bake sale. There's a blood drive next week. There's always some extracurricular happening, which is awesome. Uh, everyone in the building is always super friendly to talk to everyone's always ready to make small talk so it's it's a a pretty fun environment for a school so it's it's fun being a student and that's all i got amazing thank you so much michael you're welcome that was great okay um so I'm just going to briefly go over the ultrasound application process. So this is our common application process for our full-time programs. So first of all, obviously, please review the admission requirements. Um, there are just a few there. Just make sure that you qualify to apply to this program. Um, secondly, prepare your supporting documents. So stuff like transcripts, resumes, all of that good stuff. Third, you'll be applying through the Ontario College Application System. So we'll be making an account on that website. The application deadline is February the 1st of 2023. There is an application and supplemental fee of $165. And the application is actually open right now. So you can apply right now if you wanted to. Um, the fourth is to register and complete our CASPER assessment. 
that is a computer-based test. It's not something you can study for. It's kind of giving on the fly verbal or written responses to certain questions. So you'll have to register on Take Altus. You will get an account. You'll get a nine-digit OCAS number or Mr. ID. And then finally, to submit your supporting documents by the deadline, that is a very important step as well. That deadline is February the 8th, 2023. Then after all those steps are completed, you just kind of wait and hope that you get in. And that's about it for that. So we're going to move on to our second and final program of this session, and that is the Magnetic Resonance Imaging Program at Mitchner. This is a part-time program, unlike ultrasound. So I am going to skip over this just because in the interest of time, because um, we did start a little bit late. Um, so I'm going to get into our discussion with our chairs and faculty. So we have the wonderful Shahida with us today as well. Um, so our first question here is, can you describe the ideal candidate for this program? I'm going to start us off and then I'm going to hand it over to Shahida. So uh, yes, Emma is correct. Uh, the MRI program is different from the ultrasound program in a number of different aspects. One, this is our program is what we call a second discipline program. So this program is specifically designed um, for folks who are actually uh, already working in one of the other medical radiation sciences. So either a radiological technologist, nuclear medicine, radiation therapist, or a sonographer. Um, so you're right, and so we're looking for folks who are basically looking to expand on their current practice to acquire what we call a second discipline in the medical radiation sciences field and become licensed to practice in that. So with that, we're looking for somebody obviously who has the aptitude, um, who, um, uh, who definitely has time management skills because you are talking about trying to manage and balance that work-life balance between whatever other personal responsibilities you are, have and professional responsibilities are with your studies. Um, and uh, obviously we are looking for somebody who can manage a very fast pace um, and safety focused environment um, uh, uh, with regards to the profession. And so to get into the details of that, I'm going to hand that over to Shahida actually to speak a little bit more about some specific specifics. Goodness, I can't speak now. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Catherine. So what I have to add to that is that, first of all, MRI is a very exciting profession and the modality right now is in extremely high demand. And the program itself is for anyone who's looking to work in an exciting and stimulating profession, or for anyone who's looking to enhance their patient care skills, technical skills, as well as their interprofessional skills. Because in some cases, you will need to work directly with uh, healthcare professionals from other disciplines like respiratory therapists, nurses, referring physicians, anesthesiologists, and of course, radiologists. Um, in MR, you have the opportunity to work in a team setting and strengthen teamwork skills, or there's times when you have to work alone, and you have the opportunity to work self-sufficiently to accomplish tasks, which of course can be very gratifying. It requires excellent organizational and communication skills, and it's very important to work efficiently so that you maintain optimal patient output or throughput while maintaining optimal diagnostic quality in your MR exams. So as an MR technologist, you are constantly learning and improving. Now, like Catherine mentioned, um, during the program, it is important to keep up with the course material and not fall behind because um, you know, it's crucial for the learner to be engaged and take initiative in their studies, as well as learn to manage their time effectively in order to balance your you know, education, your work life, your personal life, and one of the most exciting aspects of the program is the clinical practicum, where you have the opportunity to practice everything that you've learned in the program. And finally, um, for candidates already employed in a healthcare setting, if endorsed by your employer, there may be opportunities to complete your uh, the clinical semester at your place of employment. Amazing. Thank you so much, both of you. That was great. Okay, so moving on to the next question here. Um, what are the soft skills that are required for a profession in MRI? Do you want me to take this, Catherine? Okay, so 
Because um, an MR tech or MR technologist works directly with patients, it's very important to have good bedside manners. And it's also very important to be patient, to have compassion and be empathetic. And as I've already mentioned, in some cases, MR technologists work directly with professionals in other disciplines. So it's also very important to have excellent interpersonal and communication skills. Um, also, um, you have to be organized, efficient, you have to have an eagerness to learn, as well as the ability to work independently or in a team setting. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, Catherine, I don't know if you had anything to add, but if not, I can move on to the next question. Well summarized by Shahida. Thank you. Amazing. Great. Short and sweet. I like it. <laughs> okay. Next question. Uh, can you describe a day in the life of this profession? Okay. Sorry, Catherine, did you want to start? I was going to say start with shift work. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> well, first of all, um, MRI uses a powerful magnet for imaging. So we don't want anything metallic or electronic inside or around the MR unit. Therefore, one of the most important responsibilities we have is ensuring both patient and public safety in and around the MRI environment. In MRI, patient appointments are scheduled, so it's not a walk-in service. Therefore, it's important to be efficient and stay on time so that patients receive their MRI exams at their scheduled times. Keep in mind that some patients have to fast for their exams, for instance, pelvic exams or abdominal MR exams. So it's also important to stay on schedule so that fasting patients are not kept waiting for extended periods of time. Now, when you arrive for your shift, after greeting your team, of course, you don the required PPE. For instance, you wear an appropriate face mask, a face shield, so that you're protected when working directly with patients, and some patients may have isolation precautions. Then you debrief with your team and consider what needs to get done next. So for instance, you may need to take over a case from a team member because it's the end of their shift, or they need to go for their meal break, or you may need to go prep the next patient in the schedule so that they're ready to go for their MRI exam. It's important to have the next patient in the schedule prepared and ready to go because this optimizes the workflow and avoids delays in between patients. Sorry, this is kind of like a long-winded answer, but it's important. So in terms of patient preparation uh, in MR, well, that takes time and it includes things like verbal and written safety screening to ensure that the patient does not have any contraindicated implants and, and or devices in or inside their bodies. It involves changing the patients into MRI safe gowns, asking the patients to remove their jewelry and safely lock up their belongings in provided lockers, initiating intravenous access for patients that require contrast injections to be administered for their MR exams. Therefore, MR techs get trained in IV access or venipuncture. Now, before we begin the MR exam, we ensure that the exam room is clean and we set up the ancillary imaging equipment necessary for that particular exam. We then position the patient on the equipment or vice versa and provide necessary patient instructions. Using state-of-the-art equipment and software, we perform and monitor the MRI exam according to the prescribed protocols. And who prescribes the protocols? Our radiologists. And also, if needed, we adapt the procedure according to the patient's condition. Some patients feel claustrophobic in the MR unit and may need additional support to complete their MRI exams. We ensure that all exams are performed correctly, which means we also check for any irregularities and address all discrepancies. We complete post-processing on select data acquisitions. We ensure that the patient's needs are met before we release them. And after the exam, we, we clean the equipment and prepare the exam room for the next patient. We clean all equipment after each use. We also have to organize MR exams for hospital inpatients. Now, lastly, I just wanna describe the workflow very briefly. So generally, in terms of workflow and work distribution, MR technologists in a team alternate between preparing and scanning patients. So for instance, 
um, say the first scheduled patient arrives and you prepare that patient and then perform their MR exam. While you're performing that patient's exam, your colleague is preparing the next scheduled patient and would then perform that patient's exam. While they're doing that, you go and prepare the patient after that and so on and so forth. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Shahida. Um, Catherine, any uh, last words before we move on? Uh, the only thing I'm just going to add is that MRI, uh, depending on where the MRI unit uh, or the MRI department is, um, it is shift work. So you could be working days, you could be working evenings, you could be working nights. Um, so that would be, you know, so, and again, depending on um, where you are and the clinic, et cetera, that could really determine what kind of uh, work you're doing. Amazing. Thank you so much, Catherine Shigeru. Okay, so that concludes our faculty panel for MRI. And now we're going to get into the MRI student discussion. So that's this with Deanna. She's our current MRI student. Um, so Deanna, our first question for you today is, uh, why did you choose the MRI program? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Sound great. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Um, well, personally, I had a desire to learn more about the human body. Coming from an x-ray background, I wanted to further my education. Um, I find pathology really interesting. And so being able to visualize disease right in front of me in different planes, different contrasts make the job fascinating. And it keeps me on my toes in regards to continuous learning. Um, in MRI, we, we scan anatomy in great detail and, and we see things like multiple sclerosis in the brain. We're doing body scans for tumors, infections, cysts, or anything that's causing the patient pain or, or symptoms. Um, I know as a student right now, I'm, I'm still learning new things every day. And there's, there's, there's things that I'm still learning about. And, and that keeps me interested and that keeps me eager to learn. Um, in addition, MRI is, is, is the future of medicine. We're seeing uh, new advances in the machines that we're using and more and more patients needing this test to be performed. So we're seeing great job prospects in, in the future and that's a great bonus for us. Amazing, thank you so much, Deanna. Okay, our next question for you is, um, can you tell us maybe about like a course that you really enjoyed or like something you've done in a course that you really loved? <laughs> well, uh, there's a lot of physics. Uh, physics was definitely the most challenging part of the program, um, and that's just based on all of the technicalities of, of how the scanner works. We learn about how the images are produced, um, how the sequences run, and how they are also produced. We learn about the equipment that we're using, the coils that we use. They're all necessary to create diagnostic images. We learn about image artifacts, things on our images that don't belong. Um, as well as other courses that we do. We, we, we take a course on anatomy and pathology. Again, a lot of anatomy for me, it just wasn't bones anymore. We were looking into muscles, uh, soft tissue. We're looking at tendons, ligaments, organs. And with that, all the new pathologies, we're looking at uh, like MSK, we're looking at acute and chronic illnesses. Um, so a lot of that and patient care, we are learning how to communicate with our patients. We're going over infection control. We are recognizing um, um, contrast reactions in our patients. We are going over screening, making sure that our patients are great candidates for the scan. Not everybody can have an MRI scan. So we're just making sure we're creating a safe environment for both the patient and the staff. Amazing. Thank you so much. Okay, Thanks. so Deanna. Oh, yeah, I sorry. No comment, Catherine had sorry. Any, yeah, I just, no worries. Sorry, I was giggling when Deanna mentioned physics. Um, so yes, there is a lot of physics, <laughs> but it's kind of important. <laughs> but but it very, really is like, very heavy in physics. And and I think one of the very things heavy that physics kind of freaks physics. Me, what freaks people out is a very specific type of physics, which is not um which is not what we learn in radiation yes. physics, right? So, so it can be a little daunting. Yes. But, but yes. as you, yeah, but as you pointed it For out, sure. you kind of can't do what it is you need to do 
unless you understand the physics yes. behind it. And that's kind of where, where it's key, right? I'm not looking for Sheldon Coopers, please no. Yes. But, um, but we do need people who understand how the technology is generating those image so that you can actually um, uh, do the job and adapt to the patient, right? Yes. Yes, definitely like the most important course <laughs> was the <laughs> physics. <laughs> yeah. Lots of learning. Definitely different. I like I came from x-ray, no radiation involved in MRI, whole different field of learning. That's great. Yeah, I'm personally not a huge fan of physics. <laughs> but uh, I don't I got think to... many people are, but yeah, don't, don't let that be discouraging. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. rewarding so far. Yeah, I mean, I assumed in, in MRI, you would need to know some physics, but <laughs> okay. Amazing, great. Thank you so much to you both for that amazing answer. Um, so our final question for you, Deanna, is um, just in general, what's it like for you being a student at Missioner? Yeah, so being a student has been both challenging and exciting um, in terms of the work we've been doing. We, we would meet as a class for lecture, I believe it was once a week, and then we would be assigned textbook readings that we would do anytime during the week, um, whenever we found time. Um, it is a demanding program. It did require a lot of time. Um, but again, giving the time to the schoolwork would mean that we would do better. Um, I felt supported by my teachers. They're just an email away. Um, it is also a small class size. My classmates and I were always talking to each other. We have a WhatsApp group. We stay connected. We're asking each other questions. We're going over the assignments together. Um, and also that this program is offered completely online. So those lectures that we're attending, I'm just doing them from home. It's really nice not to have to go anywhere to go to school. Um, no regrets overall. Amazing. Thank you so much, Tana. Okay, uh, that wraps up our student panel for MRI. So with that, I am just going to go over the application process because it is quite different from our full-time application process. Um, but the first two steps are very similar. So first of all, review the admission requirements, uh, make sure that you know what they are, that you qualify before you try to apply for the MRI program. Um, secondly, prepare your supporting documents. This could be transcripts, proof of licensing, all that good stuff. Um, third, apply with, with OCAS. So the application deadline is May 31st, 2023. We have a supplemental and application fee of $165. And then finally, submit your supporting documents to OCAS, and that deadline is June 7th of 2023. And that is that for the MRI program. So um, I did want to take an opportunity to do a live Q&A. Um, so I see there's a few Q&A things in the chat here. Um, so I don't know, um, Catherine, if maybe you could speak to this. Uh, like how many lectures are on conducted online this year? I, I believe they're mostly all online. Am I correct in assuming that? Uh, well, if, <laughs> I'm always careful with this. So I'm going to start with MRI and then we'll move to ultrasound and I might defer over to she, uh, Sheena actually. Oh no, Sheena stepped off. Um, so for MRI, as Deanna mentioned, uh, our program's part-time. Our program, as, I, as we mentioned earlier, is specifically for folks who are working. So it is completely online. The didactic component is completely online. What that means is, is that um, we tell students they should be allocating a minimum of seven hours a week to their studies. Um, two of those hours are allocated for what we call synchronous um, live sessions, just like we're having right now, where the faculty will be presenting and going over material with the students um, that hopefully they have done their pre-readings and pre-work so that they can deepen their understanding. Um, and then the rest of the time is that the content is actually situated in a manner that students can do self-study in, in, as guided by their faculty. And then they move into clinical and, and we do have some synchronous sessions there to start them off and then they're into clinical and at full time. For ultrasound, the majority of the program for, for lectures are um, are primarily delivered online, uh, but there are a lot of hands-on components, as Michael, I know, can attest to, um, and those have to take place in person. There's only, only so many things you can do um, with regards to preparing for entry um, into uh, ultrasound that can be done virtually. You have to actually get in 
and practice in lab environments um, to do uh, hands-on practice. Um, and so our position on that from a Michener standpoint um, uh, uh, over the last couple of years has been trying to really coordinate the scheduling of that to minimize the number of times that a student may have to commute to come to Toronto. So the hands-on components that would take place at Michener would be concentrated in a couple of days a week for a given student and other content would be taking place. The other days of the week would be more allocated to more online work and or self-study work. And that's general principles for um, all of our programs, but I know that is a principle that is being followed um, in ultrasound. And so, so, so yeah, so there's uh, lectures that will, could be taking place online or they could be pre-recorded, asynchronous, et cetera, but definitely hands-on components, mandatory hands-on components that students would have to come to Michener to do. And I don't know Maybe. if Michael wanted to add to that at all, if he's still there. If he's still there. <laughs> yeah, he's still there. Nope, that was all. <laughs> I definitely agree with that. From a first-hand perspective, that's all definitely accurate. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a strange time we're in right now, um, but bear with us as we get everybody back to in-person instruction. Um, okay, so I think our ultrasound representatives have unfortunately mostly left for the night. Um, so this question is that for ultrasound clinical placements, is it the same where you can be placed anywhere in Canada or is it relatively close to the Institute? I believe it's the placements can be anywhere in Canada. Um, for ultrasound, for ultrasound itself, off the top of my head, because I Susan and I work pretty closely together. Um, primarily, they are based in Ontario. Um, they might be a little bit further afield than GTA. So, um, right. and GTA is a pretty broad <laughs> spectrum. So, you know, if you happen to be commuting as I am from the Durham region. Um, please do not be upset or surprised if you get placed in the GTA um, in Mississauga. Um, so that, that is actually a very distinct reality. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so GTA can be very broad, um, but I, and primarily for the most part, we're focused on the GTA but ultrasound, for ultrasound, but I believe there might be placements a little bit further afield. To the best of my knowledge, they are all in the province of Ontario, though. Perfect. Well, I guess it's a bit better for that person if they don't have to travel too, too far. Um, so I can answer this next question. Um, if you have a CASPER test already scheduled for this year, but you didn't use like your Michener number, um, that's totally fine. As long as it's the Canadian Professional Health Sciences test, you can use those results uh, to apply to a Michener program as well. And uh, just a note on that, I think somebody else asked a question. You can take one CASPER test for every cycle of admissions. So that is answered. All good there. Um, is CASPER a prerequisite for both the ultrasound and MRI? I don't think it is for MRI. I Not for wrong. MRI. No, MRI yeah. is what we call a post-certificate program, so it's very different. Um, so CASPER is not a prerequisite currently for the MRI program. For sonography, mm -hmm. it is, though. Yes. Okay, so those are good. Okay, any other questions? Feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, feel free to look through the answered questions as well. Maybe your answer will be in there. This is a, um, is a good question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, I don't know the exact acceptance rate at the moment. Um, we do have relatively small class sizes just because our institution itself is small. We want to make sure we have enough resources, enough faculty support for all of our students. Um, I do not know it off the top of my head, unfortunately. Um, sorry about that. What I can tell you is ultrasound is a very competitive program. Yes. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of qualified applicants for a very small cohort. Yes. So um, the ultrasound class this year has 24 students. So it is a very small class size. We were actually, is it okay if I answer the question? Yeah, go for yeah. it. We were, it's just because we were talking about it earlier in the program. There was around 600 applicants for the ultrasound program this year. 24 got in, so that's okay. around 5%. That would be about right. So very competitive, yes. <laughs> okay, so this question is, how is CGPA calculated? Um, so we take your entire degree. Um, we take that whole thing into consideration for your average. 
we use something called the Ontario Medical Schools um, grading scale. So basically we take the grades you get at your school, we kind of standardize them according to an online table. You can find that on the OMSAS website. Um, so essentially, if you convert all of your grades with that table, you can calculate your entire CGPA that we would use. Um, okay, uh, the next question is regarding those who are in the CMRITO, what will we do? I'm just going to ask a clarifying question. Mohammed, is that related if you're looking at MRI? Yes. Okay. So if you are a registered member of our provincial regulatory body, which is the College of Medical Radiation and Imaging Technologies of Ontario, you therefore have to be certified in one of those disciplines, which makes you, which is a prerequisite for consideration for entry into our MRI program. So you would be asked as part of the application process to provide proof of that registration and your certification. Um, just a, and that basically tells us that yes, this is a licensed individual in their primary discipline, whatever that happens to be. There are other requirements as well, but you definitely that that definitely would um, do that. Um, in terms of the other two ultrasound uh, qualifications, that is, you'd have to look specifically at the admissions requirements. There are certain ones that, um, particularly the American ones, that might not necessarily be considered. So, but that's a question that you can always ask if you're not sure about your application qualifications. The so, other thing I'll just add, Emma, if yeah. you don't mind. Oh yeah, no, MRI, no, part of, uh, it's not an admission requirement, but as part of the application process, applicants are asked to complete a screening questionnaire. And this is important um, because if you are looking to practice in MRI, as Shahida was mentioning earlier, there are some safety pieces because you're dealing with extremely strong magnets. The last thing that I want to see as a chair is somebody come into the program who goes through and puts all that work into the studies only to find out that they actually can't even walk into a room where there is that magnet because they have something that is within their body that cannot be removed, but that unfortunately puts them at risk of uh, being seriously injured or potentially killed depending on what it is that, uh, you know, if it's an implant or whatever it happens to be. So, you know, there's a reason why that is required. Um, it's not going to necessarily, we're not using it to say yes or no as to whether somebody's going to come into the program or not, but it's an opportunity for someone who's considering it to educate themselves as to whether they actually are suitable to go into that profession. Thank you so much, Catherine. Okay, so we are at a 602, so I'm just going to kind of end our live Q&A for now, um, but... If you do have more questions, um, we are holding a Ask MI session every Wednesday from 1 to 2 p.m. until February 9th of next year. These are hour-long sessions with our admissions team. They can answer any of the questions that you have today about our programs. Um, they'll be ending February 9th, and they will resume in April once all the applications are submitted. And we also have two upcoming information sessions for more questions you may have. Um, the first one is our full-time program session. It is on next Wednesday, 4 to 5 p.m. EST. And then the one right after that is our part-time program, so stuff like MRI. We'll be answering those questions on the 24th from 4 to 5 p.m. And that is with our wonderful admissions team. And of course, if you have any questions that you are dying to ask us, feel free to email us at admissions at .ca. We have our incredible admissions team monitoring that email inbox as well, and they would be happy to answer any questions you have about admissions, application processes, any of that. Um, and all of our um, applications are open now, and uh, yeah, feel free to apply if you want to do that as well. <laughs> okay, um, and with that, we will be wrapping up our ultrasound and MRI session tonight. Thank you so much for waiting the extra 10 minutes um, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your night. And thank you so much for coming. All right, take care, everyone. Bye.